Good morning and uh, welcome everyone to this conversation on the future of U.S. naval strategy. I'm Richard Fontaine, CEO of the Center for a New American Security. Uh, as the United States navigates this competitive global environment, there are a few issues really that are more pressing than the enterprise for naval forces around the world from South China Sea to the Arctic to other parts of the globe, U.S. naval strategy and the strategies of its competitors uh, will help define the future of geopolitical power. And so to discuss that strategy, we're really pleased to have with us today Admiral Mike Gilday. Admiral Gilday is the 32nd Chief of Naval Operations, the position he took up in August 2019. Uh, he has commanded Carrier Strike Group 8, U.S. Fleet Cyber Command, the U.S. 10th Fleet, he serves as director of the Joint Staff and has uh, a number of other distinguished command and staff assignments. Um, so we would like to welcome Admiral Gilday uh, to the Center for New American Security. He's got some opening thoughts that he'll share uh, for a few minutes with us, and then uh, we'll get the conversation going in earnest. Um, Admiral Gilday, welcome, and thanks for joining us this morning. Richard, thanks for having me. And for all those tuning in, thank you uh, for the opportunity to talk to you today and to engage a little bit in um, uh, certainly what's going on in the world, but also uh, where the Navy's going in the future. Most of my remarks today and my answers to your questions will largely be focused on implementation of my uh, navigation plan. Uh, and so that really gets at force development and force design and where we're headed, where we're headed as a Navy and our focus. But to just step back for a second, uh, last fall, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, or the Commandant of the Coast Guard and I signed a tri-service maritime strategy. And nested below that tri-service maritime strategy are the Commandant's planning guidance and my NAB plan. That tri-service strategy really takes a look uh, at how we employ naval forces or maritime, how we employ forces in the maritime domain uh, uh, across our three services, and then how we get at the complex problems of force development and force design uh, together in the years ahead. Uh, and so we are lockstep, uh, the three of us, in terms of integrating uh, more soundly together, particularly in this decade, which we see as a key time frame for us in order to, uh, in order to not, uh, in order to maintain advantages that we have against uh, China in particular, and to close gaps in areas where we know uh, we may be slipping behind. My navigation plan really uh, uh, speaks to Navy leadership and it directs Navy leadership to take a look across about 16 different discrete areas that I wanna put focus on in this decade. Key problems that we need to solve and they fall in four uh, broad areas of capacity, so fleet size, uh, capability, um, uh, sailors, and then um, readiness. And I, I mentioned readiness last, but Readiness tends to be uh, tends to be my primary area of focus um, because I believe that uh, if if we do have to fight tonight uh, or if we do have to fight in 2025, that the force that we fight with um, uh, may not meet all of our expectations, but they are going to fall to the level at which we have trained and resourced them. And so that constant focus on readiness and training is really, really important. Particularly when you, when you think about the fact that the fleet that we have today of 298 ships, we will have 70% of that force a decade from now in 2030. So it's really important that we take care of it. And from a practical standpoint, uh, the Hill shouldn't expect that we ask for more money for more ships if we can't maintain the fleet that we have. So with that, Richard, kind of setting the table, I'm happy to delve into any areas uh, that the audience would like uh, to go more deeply into. Great, thanks, Admiral. And I'm gonna kick it off with some uh, some questions of my own. And as folks in the audience have questions, if you wanna put them in the Q&A box, then we'll take those up um, as we can. But let me actually start with this question of readiness and um, maybe you can give us a sense of the current readiness of the fleet and also, um, the effect that COVID has or hasn't had on readiness, how has that impacted things? Yeah, thanks. Um, so we've been able over the past year, uh, deep into COVID, 
deep into the pandemic, we've been able to maintain our mission profile of keeping about a third of the Navy at sea. That's taken a lot of work in terms of roaming crews, uh, testing, uh, changing behavior on ships, uh, including, um, of course, PPE, masks, social distancing, but also in terms of how people move about ships, right? In small groups or small cohort cohorts, typically those people that are gonna be working on uh, the same equipment together or standing watch together in the same space, we try to keep them together when they eat. Uh, we, we extend meal hours, of course. Uh, we transit uh, forward and aft on a ship in different ways than we had before uh, so that we maintain that distance. What that's yielded for us at this time is less than a quarter of 1% of the force being positive with respect to COVID. And so that's not only due to good guidance that we put out, I think, from uh, from our headquarters staff here, but it really comes down to the individual behavior of sailors. And so if those directives aren't followed, if people are not wearing their masks, if they're not washing their hands, if they're not cleaning up after themselves, then we're not going to be able to maintain that low rate of, uh, of positivity and we're not going to be able to get ships underway uh, that are ready for anything. And so uh, that's been a key, uh, that's been a big challenge for us over the past year. Consistently, I'd say over the last eight or nine months, we've been down at the 1% of the force being positive or well below that as we are right now. Uh, vaccinations, of course, are going to help. And uh, right now about 35% of the force is vaccinated. As soon as we get those doses, we are putting them into arms as quickly as we can, and that'll get us to a better place. It has affected, COVID has affected the industrial base, as you can imagine. It also has affected the supply chain. Uh, the, the, the silver lining there is, I think, a noticeable lack of opaqueness between industry and the services in terms of where we stand with not only new production lines, think F-35, think ships coming out of shipyards like uh, DDGs, uh, but also uh, in the supply chain, and and we've been able to focus on the uh, you know the brittleness uh, in some cases of that chain that has been affected to the point where if if we only have a single source supplier, for example, and if it's and if that single source is out of the country, it really can complicate things, and and a a serial production uh, uh, kind of uh, framework in terms of repairing a piece of equipment, it can put things to all stop. So it's really taken a look at, forced us to take a look at working with industry is where can we find alternative parts? Where can we fix things faster instead of instead of buying new? And so it has changed, it has changed our behavior. Uh, but I think, as I said, trying to look for the silver uh, lining here in terms of what's making us better. Uh, I'll pause here for any follow-ons, Richard. Well, just on this question of vaccines, so is there an issue of vaccine hesitancy, uh, you know, sailors? I mean, all of the things that you talked about, the mask, the hand washing, all the things that, you know, changing what you do, it's almost like if you could imagine there was just one shot that people could take that would make those things less necessary. And in fact, of course, there is. Um, but it's but it's not mandatory. There's a call uh, from some lawmakers for the commander in chief to make it mandatory. There are a lot of jabs that are mandatory for sailors and Marines. Um, do you have a problem with vaccine hesitancy in the Navy? And is it a good idea to make uh, vaccines mandatory? So with respect to the hes hesitancy, yes, that is concerning because I'd like to get I'd like to get every ship underway with 100 uh, percent immunized crews. In some cases, we're up at 97, 98 percent. We found that instead of bringing the crew to the vaccine, if we bring the vaccine to the crew and we line the crew up, let's say, uh, let, let's say together uh, at the ship or at the submarine, at the aviation squadron, as they stand there and as they uh, as they talk amongst themselves, uh, there's there's a bit of peer pressure there that tends to bend things in a positive direction in, in terms of people uh, saying, yeah, OK, if you're going to get it, I'm going to get it. We're in this as a team. Again, it is voluntary at this point, and so we can't pressure anybody to take it. In terms of incentivizing, uh, as we understand the effectiveness of the vaccine better, I think that we'll begin to see a loosening up of restrictions. Again, this has to be balanced against a potential another surge here in, in, the, in, in the country, right? And so our, our really our safest speed is slow here in terms of taking this a day at a time, a week at a time, taking a look at our immunization rates, 
taking a look at uh, the ongoing studies that are trying to determine whether or not um, immun immunization affects uh, your ability to transmit COVID, uh, which is still an unknown. Uh, and so we're just stepping through it a day at a time right now, uh, Richard. I would like to get to the point based on science, if I could incentivize a little bit more, say if I could open up places on a base uh, to people that were immunized in a way that uh, that would give them a little bit more freedom and make it a little bit more attractive to get the vaccine. I certainly want to step in that direction. But again, we're, we're in, since we had the uh, problem on Theodore Roosevelt over a year ago, we've been on a daily basis in contact with not only the CDC, but public health officials in every single uh, location where we have a base to understand uh, to understand uh, the nature of the the nature of the virus uh, day to day. Great. And um, let me just switch gears a little bit. You mentioned the four priorities in your NAV plan. Um, so you got readiness, capabilities, capacity and sailors. And, um, you know, there's obviously always going to be trade offs among uh, current operations, investing in more advanced capabilities for the future and, and, and capacity. Um, if we have a flat or even declining uh, defense budget, how are you thinking about the allocating resources among those various priorities? So what the NAT plan, I hope, is going to help us do is uh, understand better what those priorities are. So um, in the NAD plan, what I made clear is that the Navy exists, uh, the functions that the Joint Force needs from the Navy are sea control and power projection. And some might consider that trite, you know, or, you know, not, not worth not worth repeating, same old, same old. But there have been occasions in the past where when you lose sight of those ends, why, you know, what your main, what your main thing is, you can get off track and you can put money against, you can put precious resources against big programs that don't advance the Navy uh, or any service with respect to those, uh, with respect to those ends. And so, first of all, I wanted everybody to be cited on the fact that the things that we're going to spend our money on are going to make us more lethal and more effective with respect to sea control and power projection. And that also goes hand in glove with the, the distributed maritime uh, operations concept and how that fits into the broader uh, uh, joint warfighting concept that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is working on with his staff. And I, I would expect the Secretary of Defense to ultimately endorse. And so those 16 areas that I talked about really receive our highest priority. We assembled virtually all of our uh, flag officers in the Navy two weeks ago to talk about the implementation of the NAV plan. And so um, as an example, over the past year and a half, we've had great success with a uh, framework that we call perform, to, uh, perform the plan. And um, what that's helped us to do with respect to Super Hornets is to get readiness, is to get Michigan capable rates up from 50 percent, where they've been a decade, to a sustained 80 percent. But to do that without lathering it with a with with money, but rather to take a look at what is what is the output? The output that we're that we're seeking is 80 percent Michigan capable rate. What are those key activities at our depots and our main facilities that we need to leverage in order to get us to 80 percent? What barriers do we have to remove in order to help get us to 80 percent? Who's ultimately identifying who's ultimately responsible for achieving the 80 percent and who is responsible for supporting and their discrete requirements in that enterprise uh, to help achieve the goal has been a framework that we have now transferred to public shipyards and driving down delay days and, and public shipyards. My first year in the job, my goal was to, to drive down those delay days by uh, by 80 percent. And so. When I came into the job, as an example, in, in public shipyards, we were only getting 30 to 35 percent of our ships out of maintenance uh, on time, 35 percent of the time. That's unacceptable. Uh, and so using this same kind of process that we use with Super Hornets, we're transferring that to public yard uh, shipyard maintenance, private yard shipyard maintenance, challenges that we have in the manpower area in terms of manning the fleet at 100 percent. And so we're trying to take that same framework and apply it to each of those problem sets within the NAB plan. We believe that in many of those cases, we are following industry best standards. That's what we learned from, 
from our journey in naval aviation with Super Hornets. I hope that's helpful, uh, Richard, in answering your question. Yeah, it is. No, thank you. Um, let me uh, pick up a question that's come in um, from the audience. And here's Dimitri Sevastopoulou from the Financial Times with a typically direct question for you. Do you share the concern of some of your colleagues that China could try to seize Taiwan within six years? I, I don't think we should ignore that possibility. Admiral Davidson was pretty adamant in his testimony when he talked about that. And so, uh, so, so what I think about um, what I think about with respect to the investments we're making today, with respect to the concept development that we're doing with the Marine Corps in particular, is uh, is developing uh, uh, the fleet that we need to win in 2025. Having the fleet having the fleet ready to win tonight. Uh, is important. Uh, looking out to 2025, 2030, 2045, and taking a look at our investment streams that, again, are going to drive us towards a Navy that can provide sea control and power projection are critically important. And I can talk about, you know, some of those some of those attributes that we're actually uh, trying to provide the fleet and are providing the fleet, but it gets us to a bigger, better, more capable Navy uh, in five to 10 years. Let me uh, pick up on on that and ask you about the uh, 30 year shipbuilding plan that the Trump administration released in December. So this is a, a, around a 500 ship Navy by 2045, not just expand the size of the fleet, but also shift the composition, emphasize smaller surface vehicles, unmanned ships, increase survivability and lethality. Um, some people are saying the plan's unaffordable. Um, Secretary Esper said, well, not maybe not enough changes necessary to compete with China. Um, other folks say, well, the Biden administration is going to come in and change it anyway. So what, what, what do you what's the current status of, of the thinking behind that plan? And um, and, and how do you uh, how do you see that plan uh, today in terms of the kind of challenges that the Navy mm -hmm. has going forward? Yeah, thanks. Um so I just say initially that if we take a look at the studies that have that have been done, if we go back to five, five years before the NDS, and then even the studies that have been done since the NDS, they've all consistently pointed at one thing. We need a bigger, more capable Navy that over the past two decades, we have tended uh, not to uh, not, not to put strategic investments um, behind the fleet like we probably should have. And so we find our play. We find ourselves in a position where we're, we're falling behind. But it's easy to get seduced by the numbers and we shouldn't. What we really need to be focused on is capabilities and particularly what capabilities the Navy can close for the joint force. And so uh, so that has led a uh, the, the shipbuilding plan, which was based off the future Naval Force Structure Study, was really focused on operationally relevant metrics, right? Things like lethality, survivability, operational reach—those things that are going to—they're going to—that are going to uh, allow the Navy to, to to synergistically be much more effective uh, within the joint force. But also to factor in, uh, you know, to keep it real with respect to things that you can't ignore, which are things like total ownership costs, maintenance costs, technical risk of new programs versus operational risk in the transition of sundowning uh, uh, legacy programs, thinking about industrial-based capacity and what the art of the possible is or is not with respect to certain platforms. So in the end, Richard, what we become more focused on with respect to the analysis that we've done is the composition of the fleet, right, with respect to capabilities that then translates into platforms. And what the FNFS did, the Future Naval Force Structure Study did, is it allow us to think about what what that comp what what composition what composition makes us most effective in those areas that I mentioned over the long term? Uh, so you see a heavy uh, emphasis on undersea as an example. You see more emphasis on smaller ships because we're going to fight in a distributed manner rather than larger ships. You see an emphasis on capabilities like hypersonics from an offensive perspective. Uh, capabilities like directed energy, lasers uh, from a from a, a fleet survivability uh, focus, an emphasis on logistic ships because that because we need to sustain a distributed force, and so 
that is, I, I, I think that uh, that analysis is sound. I, my take on the uh, current discussions inside the Pentagon uh, uh, with OSD uh, as we as we close in a 22 budget, we are grounding decisions on that analysis that was done last year under Secretary Esper. I will say this, that that analysis is not static. And so we have ongoing experiments, uh, fleet battle problems, exercises, war games, and analysis that further updates that uh, that future naval force study assessment that was done that finished in the summer in the summer of 20. And so we shouldn't look at that as a, as a static document. In another month, actually this month in a few weeks, we're going to do a big unmanned exercise off of California that's going to further inform our understanding of where we need to go where we need to go with unmanned, particularly the capabilities and then eventually the numbers. I hope that's helpful, Richard. Yeah, can I just pick up on one one aspect yep. of this, um, and that that's on the future carrier air wing. Um, how are you thinking about that, and particularly in the mix of manned and unmanned uh, aircraft? I'll say up front that uh, so so if I go back to what do we need to win in twenty twenty five, right? Um, among the changes that you're going to see is a doubling of F thirty fives out there in the fleet, and so uh, doubling of fr from where we are today, and so. We begin to get to that 50, 50, fourth and fifth generation mix, right? Using those capabilities together with a wing, with weapons, with more range uh, and greater speed that put us in a, a much better position of advantage if we have to get into a fight with a near peer uh, adversary. With respect to, to manned and unmanned, um, you know, recently Admiral Kilby, our, uh, our uh, uh, deputy CNO for integration, uh, he spoke to the fact that we will uh, uh, we will go from a 40 percent from a 40 60 mix of unmanned and manned eventually uh, to a 60 40 mix of unmanned and manned into the into the 2030s. We're making good progress right now with the MQ-25, the Stingray, which was originally designed as a refueling platform that will have the capacity to put other payloads on it, and we're operating that off of carriers now. Um, we will go IOC uh, on that particular uh, uh, platform in a few years, and that is using that using that uh, uh, using the MQ-25 in conjunction with current air wings and F-35s is giving us a better understanding of what that uh, manned unmanned teaming is going to look like. So, uh, as an example, uh, you could think about a flight or a division of of four ships in the air, right? And one of those is going to be manned and three are going to be unmanned as an example, right? And that's how we would operate and fight. But it's going to take us some time to get to the point where conceptually uh, we're comfortable with operating in that fashion. So this is an iter iterative approach. We do have a sense of urgency, but we're also trying to be very deliberate because what we don't want to do is make rash decisions on buying things in great numbers that aren't necessarily going to serve us well uh, you know, a decade or more from now, uh, uh, when when we uh, uh, when when we have them in uh, in greater quantities. Great. Let me um, pick up on another question from the audience. This one is asking how the various programs of the Navy, Marines, Air Force, and Army are coordinated vis-a-vis -vis China, as it appears each service is going its own way. Um, so, and then there's, well, there's another question about coordination, but maybe I'll pitch that one to you first. Uh, so, so there, there are tough discussions ongoing in the Pentagon in, in, in terms of, uh, in terms of what we're going to spend our money on. And as I said earlier for the Navy, I'm really focused on what I need to, what I need to bring to bear, not just for the sake of the Navy, but really for the joint force. The real question is how am I contributing to the joint fight? How, not how am I? How is the United States Navy contributing to the joint fight? We very rarely operate, uh, you, know, you know, alone anymore. Nearly everything we does, anything we do, has some type of joint, uh, other joint component involved. And so, uh, so I can't just think, you know, narrowly or stovepipe fashion with respect to the Navy. And the other services are the same way. And I think to, to really answer the question, uh, particularly as the joint warfighting concept becomes more mature. Um, I think that then becomes part of the yardstick in terms of uh, in terms of what we're what we're investing in against a near peer like China. I also think that the assessments that we're doing now, led by the Joint Staff and Cape OSD Cape, 
the joint net uh, military assessment gives us a much better understanding across a range of war fighting areas where our gaps and seams are with our with our major competitors we've not done an assessment like that in decades right it wasn't until we finally had the chinese breathing down our neck that we stood stepped back and said hey look the way that we've done things in the past which the, which is kind of the core of the question gets to the static you know one third one third one third split across the services is that it's going to have to change it is changing uh it has changed under the last administration and i think will continue to evolve and change under this one there's another question about uh, coordination here. This is from Tony Capaccio. Uh, the Indo-PACOM commander, so I think we're talking about Admiral Davidson here, said he'd like to install post-INF range ground-based weapons in the region. So we're talking intermediate range ground-based missiles, presumably that can hold sites at risk in and around China. Uh, what type of coordination with the Navy would that require? A, a lot, a lot. <laughs> and so we, we, we wouldn't want to do anything singularly with any service right and so um anything that we do uh particularly looking at china china that's a global problem set for us russia's a global problem set for us and so it has to go it, those problem sets need to be looked at trans-regionally and also all domain and so we can't just get cited on a particular i'm not being critical of anything that anything in the pacific defense initiative or anything that was said in testimony I'm just saying that the way we need to look at these problem sets is much more holistically, right? So that we come we come up with a solution set that isn't a that isn't a uh, a single uh, there's there's no single um, uh, gold ticket, if you will. It's gonna it's gonna solve all of our problems. Uh, again, it does. I think you have to go back to take a look at where are the gaps that we have, and how best do we close them across the joint force? And so you have to consider things like maneuverability, survivability, uh, placement, right? The, the global posture review that's currently going on, uh, led by uh, OSD, uh, directed by the Secretary of Defense, will get at some of that, right? We'll get at bases and places in, in the Indo-Pacific AOR as an example. It'll get at uh, the posture of the joint force, not only in the Indo-Pacific, but across all, uh, across, across the globe, so that we have a better understanding of how we're gonna use that force supported by those bases and places to compete and potentially put us in a position uh, to beat our adversaries if we ever get to that, if, if we're ever placed in that position. You you, you mentioned a, a, an important point that I think sometimes gets lost at the sort of strategic level discussions, which is this trans-regional aspect to the China yeah. problem. Uh, it, it's quite obvious why we would be focused uh, first and foremost on the Indo-Pacific. Um, but some of our allies in Australia, for example, have begun to talk at a strategic level, not about regional balancing, but global balancing and things like that. So from a naval perspective, a Navy perspective, what is outside the Indo-Pacific, what does the China challenge look like and how do you deal with it outside in other AORs or in other domains? So, uh, so let me give you an example. Um, a year or so ago, we deployed a hospital ship down to the Southcom AOR uh, that Admiral Fowler used for about five months. And so that ship did dozens of port visits and provided medical care to tens of thousands of people down in South America. Um, but many of those people were refugees from Venezuela, okay? And so that is providing care for people that they will never forget. We changed lives. We gave, you know, children now have eyeglasses they couldn't read before. Uh, and so it's remarkable uh, some of the things that those doctors and those medical personnel did. Some 2,000 surgeries. I think 60,000 uh, patients were, were seen over the course of that deployment. At the same time, China deployed their hospital ship, the Peace Arc, to the same region. Their care was primarily focused on Venezuelan elites. And so... That's the competition space and an example of how you can use naval forces in a way non-kinetic, no guns involved, you know, no no brandishing weapons. Uh, you know, the, the Russians uh, and the Chinese are extending a fist and we're extending a hand. That's that's an AOR where you can make a big difference um, in terms of bringing that kind of capability forward. I, I think that if you take a look at what happened in the Suez a couple of weeks ago, right, that's a, 
uh, that should get everybody's attention on the, 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 the in, in terms of um, how fragile those choke points can be. Uh, and so when the Suez uh, or the Strait of Hormuz, uh, it would be another example, the Bob Amon Deb would be another, uh, where uh, particularly for global commodities like oil, it can have a significant effect for all of us, right? And so maintaining a presence in those areas, uh, making sure that no single country feels that they can have control over those international waterways is really important. And so our day-to-day -day operations with like-minded navies, like-minded uh, uh, partners and, and allies is critically important. I think it directly uh, supports uh, what the president has said publicly and his in, uh, and has written in his in, uh, interim uh, national security guidance. And it's part and parcel of what the Navy does every day anyway. I think that, you know, when you take a look across the dime, uh, the Navy, the Navy not only plays in the military lane, but also historically in the diplomatic lane and in the economic lane. Did the Suez blockage uh, change your thinking or, or Navy thinking, or is this more of a, we told you this stuff's important for all of those who hadn't been reading about uh, the consequences of blockage of critical choke points in the front pages of their newspaper. Yeah. Um, so, you know, people take security for granted and uh, the, the people expect that, uh, that the United States be secure and uh, we owe them, we owe them that, we owe them that security. I thought that uh, Naval Forces Europe sent out a really powerful tweet uh, this past Christmas and it had a photo of ships uh, on the left-hand side and a Christmas tree with presents under it on the right-hand side. And the, 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 uh, the banner beneath said, you can't have presents, Christmas presents, without naval presence. And so I thought that was, at least for me, that was powerful. Uh, that probably most people don't, most, most of my fellow citizens don't appreciate it, but this is what we're supposed to do. And again, I go back to, for the leadership of the Navy, in terms of what we invest in, why does the nation need us? They need us for sea control and power projection. That's why we exist, to keep, to, to keep any potential foes away from the United States. We need to be forward. We need to be present to be relevant and, and to and, and to and to provide that security and that sense of security. And so it does come down to the main thing for us on a day to day basis. I guess a sign of the times, too, when the chief of naval operations can refer to a really powerful tweet. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't tell Strat, tell Stratcom to, you know, uh, kind of keep its hands off the. Uh, some of the keys on the on the keyboard. That's just a it's joke. It's powerful. It, it sure is powerful, isn't it? <laughs> uh, let me go to another question. Um, this is from um, Chad Montgomery with Senator Sass. How are the Navy and Marine Corps cooperating to ensure that Marine Corps anti ship anti uh, anti ship air defense systems can be employed from the Navy ships transporting them? Yeah. So um, we are working very closely together. So uh, the expeditionary advanced basing concept, we are practicing that uh, all the time. In fact, I, I went out to visit uh, one MEF out, out at uh, Camp Pendleton um, last month. Uh, and I met not only with that, with, with not only with the one MEF commander, but with the third fleet commander out there because, because our staffs are working, are working hand in glove on problems just like that. I'm going to meet with the seven fleet commander today and he is working together and operating together and exercising together with the uh, with a three MEF commander on a monthly basis as well. And their staffs are again connected. We're seeing the same thing in in, uh, in Norfolk, Virginia. We're seeing the same thing in Europe. And so nearly every meeting that I go to has a Marine Corps general in, in the in the room here uh, here in the Pentagon. And so we are trying to integrate not only in terms of how we operate, but in terms of how we invest. Uh, the fleet battle problems that we do with all of our ARGs and all of our deploying ARGs and all of our deploying uh, carrier strike groups really take a look at elements of distributed maritime operations and uh, EABO for the Marine Corps, which those are those are those concepts need to be exercised hand in glove. And so we're exercising elements of that on a monthly basis as we move as we move uh, carry strike groups and and uh, uh, amphibious ready groups back and forth around the world. Uh, to that point uh, about EA, EABs, that's a concept that, you know, early in development here, but that we are continuing to put focus on 
um, in a way that exercises it. Uh, I don't want to say continuously, but on a frequent basis, we are learning from uh, and revisiting uh, challenges associated with how we're going to employ uh, advanced exhibitionary bases in support of sea denial and sea control. Could you talk for uh, a minute more about the distributed maritime operations, particularly from the, the technology perspective, what technologies are necessary to make this yeah. a reality? And then also from the architecture uh, point of view. So, you know, each of the services is wants to connect all of the sensors and shooters together, but each has its own archi network architecture and communication system. So are, are those going to plug into each other? Kind of how does, how, are, how does that going to work? So I'll say first that all the service chiefs are meeting this week to talk about JADC2 and to make sure that we understand at our level what each service is doing to contribute to the overall architecture. For the Navy, um, I put a two-star in charge of a task force called Overmatch, and that project uh, is being run out of San Diego, largely by a very robust um, a group of technical, technically savvy civilians who have great connections with industry. What I'm trying to do, Richard, is what, what they're trying to do is take the networks that exist in the Navy and allow us to, uh, to transfer data, any data on any network to give us much more agility. So if you think about how we operate on a single, uh, in a single network, right, typically we do frequency hopping in order to keep, you know, any kind of adversary uh, uh, off, uh, off guard with respect to what portion of the spectrum we're actually using to transfer data. I, I refer to this as network hopping. And so what network can I use, right? That that might be uh, might have a low uh, probability of detection or low probability of intercept to pass critical data at a critical time. That has to be all software controlled. It's like your iPhone. But right now you're connected to a four or five G network, and you're also connected to the Wi-Fi in your home or your office. The software in the phone is making the determination of what network to use to to push that data. The phone is using microprocessing with respect to the, with respect to the apps to give you the information that you need when you need it. And so, uh, so with the Navy's with the Navy's uh, a network and networks kind of construct, there are four big areas that we're focused on. One of them is the infrastructure, and that's largely software, to be to be honest with you, and to use industry best practices for bringing new software or patching existing software uh, within hours rather than weeks. Um, so it's it's testing in a containerized fashion to make sure it's not gonna have an adverse effect on other operating systems and deploying that software quickly. So that's the infrastructure piece. The networks piece is the second part, and I kind of alluded to that with a network and networks approach with, um, with some hardware that allows us, uh, that allows the, the system of systems to make a determination of what path you're gonna to choose to send the data. The third bucket is the data itself and standardizing that data to some extent, containerizing it in a way that it can travel on any network and be readable at the other end, at the far end. And then the last are battle management applications are the applications that you need to bring this all to life, right? It's useless unless you can use that data on demand uh, at a time and place where it's gonna make a difference. The reason why this is so important uh, is, first of all, we need to maintain decision advantage over the adversary. There's an awful lot of information out there. John Boyd talked about OODA, right? Observe, orient, decide, and act. Uh, that second part, the orient piece, that's a big, that's a that's a really important part. That's a really important part of OODA to take advantage of all the information that's out there to put you in a decision, to put you in a position of advantage to decide and to act faster than the adversary. With respect to JADC2 and what we're trying to do in the Navy operational architecture, there's a there's a lethality, lethality element of this where we can pass targeting data very quickly across any net from sensor to shooter that may be disassociated. That is to say that typically in the past, the, the, the sensor and the shooter were co-located. Now we're moving away from that construct to a disaggregated construct. Uh, but but that's just the lethality piece is just a part of it. I think the information advantage piece is the real power of JADC2 in terms of where we want to go. I know that was a rant and a bit of a mouthful, Richard. I'm happy to take any deeper questions on it. 
Yeah, so there's one actually um, a more specific question from Allery Shelbourne with USNI News uh, about the battle management aid that was recently fielded on the Carl Vinson, yeah. uh, helping the Navy create a tactical data network it can use across the fleet's platforms and systems. And I think the question is, how's that going? Is that is that working? Can you give us an, an, an update on that kind of specific? Yeah, so uh, what, we, what, what Overmatch is trying to do this year is four big spirals or four big tests that allow us to 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 bring more network to bring more networks into that network and network construct right so that's testing more data on more networks and introducing more battle management aids to make uh to make the end user to put the end user in a position where they can see the battle space better they can make decisions faster to put them in a position of position of advantage where we haven't before where they've had to search for data on disparate systems that weren't weren't integrated and so the applications that we're applying now are much like the applications in your phone they just you know when you when you go to your amazon app and you type in you know tennis shoes it pulls in information from hundreds if not thousands of websites and puts it all in the same format so it's easily readable and you can make a decision very quickly that's where we need to be that's where we need to be tactically and operationally as well mm. and, um, and, and, and you know, i just yeah. say as we as we move to a hybrid fleet on the sea under the sea and in the air in order to move that terabytes of data that we're going to have to move in order to command and control uh those platforms we need to think differently about command and control. This naval operational architecture is absolutely critical in that regard with respect to moving data at the right time to the right people or platforms. Great, let me um, go to another question that's come in. This is from John S. Lewis. How effective are our defensive countermeasures against Chinese and Iranian surface surface cruise missiles? And then the second part of this question, really a second question, be pretty familiar to you. Aren't our carriers particularly vulnerable? So on the so let me speak to that uh, more broadly in terms of where we're going. We've we've always had a defense in depth uh, approach to defending the fleet. Where we're going with this, and we're we're pouring a lot of uh, R and D money and actually experimenting on ships right now is with laser technology. And so, if you take you don't want to make any investments without taking a look at what your competitors are doing, right? And so. Our primary competitor, China, is putting a lot of money into space and they're putting a lot of money into missile systems. So they want to be able to find you, target you, and then put a missile on you. And so we can defend ourselves with a lot of very expensive, exquisite missiles, which is quite frankly unaffordable. Where I want to go, and what's definitely achievable, is, is a move towards laser technology. When you take a look at the Ford class carriers, specifically to the last part of your question, they generate three times the electrical power that the Nimitz class did. And so they have the capacity for laser technology. The same with the Zumwalt's. And I would argue that the same with unmanned. We could look at unmanned platforms and those unmanned are going to work together with man. Think, think of a surface action group that may have a couple of manned ships and it may have a number of unmanned platforms with a bunch of different capabilities. One of those capabilities could be uh, laser technology to defend ourselves. Today, right now, I'm confident that we can defend the fleet. In the future, this is a missile race. And just as it has been over time, uh, uh, o o over, over the span of warfare uh, over centuries, if not thousands of years, we've seen weapons uh, or implements of destruction being developed that have longer range and that have faster speed. That's not going to stop. And so we're trying to stay ahead of that with things like laser technology. I do think that carriers are survivable today. There is no more survivable airfield in the world than a carrier. So if I look out my window uh, and I take a look at Reagan National Airport, it's going to be in the same place tomorrow morning. But if that were an aircraft carrier, it could be off of Miami. It could be off of Newfoundland. And if it could go west, it'd be west of the Mississippi and Missouri. And so you can't move airfields like you can move an aircraft carrier. There, and don't just think of survivability with respect to what that carrier is carrying on it uh, to defend itself or what that carrier strike group is carrying. Remember, we're using all domains now, right? So we're leveraging space. We're leveraging cyber. We exercise to that. We practice to, us, to it frequently. We feel like our force is pretty survivable now. But again, not taking anything anything for granted. Laser technology is our future. 
Okay, um, let's go back just to the, the the people side for a moment. And uh, Secretary Austin uh, has made it a priority to eliminate extremism in the ranks. Uh, he and Secretary Hicks um, have talked about inclusivity and diversity in the ranks and the importance. And of course, they're not the first to do that. Um, maybe you can give us a sense of where you're thinking and where the Navy is headed on both diversity in the ranks at all levels, um, and then and then extremism. Is there an extremism problem in the Navy? Yeah, so um, let me talk about that broadly. I will get to the extremism piece. Uh, so after the, the tragic uh, uh, death of George Floyd, we stood up Task Force One Navy to take a look at what institutional barriers uh, are in place that, that are a problem for us with respect to systemic uh, discrimination. And so um, the way we got insights into barriers was talking to the fleet. We did hundreds and hundreds of listening sessions with sailors at all pay grades, sailors and officers at all pay grades. And we get some really good recommendations that help us think about how we break down barriers with respect to uh, recruiting uh, and, and admitting uh, uh, candidates into the Navy, uh, how we promote, advance them, and manage talent. Uh, during their careers in the Navy. Barriers that we had in place that we just couldn't even see, they were right in front of our eyes. And then, um, you know, how we promote and retain them as they get more senior was a third area that we that we took a deep look at. There were some 60 recommendations that came out of that work that we are in the implementation phase right now. Um, we had some really good discussions uh, as a result of the direction from the secretary to have a stand down on extremism. and. The real power of those stand downs are in the listening sessions with sailors. And we are compiling our observations from across the Navy. And I owe those to the Secretary of Defense. And I know that he wants to speak to those uh, more broadly. So I don't want to I don't want to get in front of him on that. But I, I will give you a, a couple of big observations that um, that I was really pleased with. One was the widespread anger and dis disgust at recent incidents that have happened across our country and within our Navy. And uh, and so that gave me the sense that the preponderance of our sailors like out, out there do not accept this kind of behavior. Uh, and the second was, um, was just a disproportionate impact that a small group can have that can stain the reputation of a service or really cause a big problem for the country. It's a very small, it's a very small minority that are causing these problems. But nonetheless, we can't just ignore that. And so within the Department of Defense and the Navy, we're taking a look at how do we identify these people be, uh, with, within our legal means before they enter the service so that we can just simply say, no, we don't, we don't want you in our group. Uh, secondly, on the far end, at the end of somebody's career, as we saw with the events of the Capitol on the 6th of January, there was some uh, prior military involved. And so we now believe that that as people leave the service, that they are being actively recruited. So I think we owe it to the force, we owe it to the country to make sailors aware, uh, sailors, soldiers, airmen, Marines aware that they are going to be actively recruited. And and that and that those are not in general, those are not groups that, that they uh, want to be associated with. They're counted to the values that we have uh, in the Navy and, and, and across the military. Um, what, uh, what I think in terms of long-term solution here, um, it's not a program that you can put money against. Um, it really comes down to individual responsibility. And I talked earlier about um, the behavior of sailors out there with respect to COVID, right? Following the rules, not only holding themselves accountable, but holding the sail to their left and to their right accountable as well. And it's going to be the same thing here with with the extreme extremism and the racism piece, right? We just can't accept it in the service. It's just not part of who we are. It's not part of it's not part of the attributes that we aspire uh, uh, to uphold from each and every one of us. And so I don't mean to get too dramatic, but but that's really that's the secret of success. The magic sauce is at an individual level that people standing up and being leaders, no matter your pay grade. Uh, and taking responsibility for your own actions, owning it when you did make a mistake, when you did something bad, 
owning it, uh, and then you'll be uh, held accountable, but also holding others accountable as well. Same thing I would say with sexual assault. Uh, similarly, that approach is right down in the deck plates at the individual level. I hope I... I hope I uh, scratch the itch on that one, Richard. Yeah, yeah, you you did. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, you mentioned in the first part of, of your response about the barriers that you identified some of to, to advancement and so forth, some of, uh, some of which the Navy may have not been fully aware of. And, and I know you, you said that you want to not get ahead of any recommendations you make to the secretary, but could you give us maybe a sense of sure. a little bit of what those barriers are and how they might be addressed? Sure, I'll give you a couple. And so, um, so the aptitude test that we give all sailors, um, it's in English. Should it be in English? If somebody, you know, maybe everybody has to, ha has to have a command of the English language to serve in the U.S. military, but some people might do better in a written exam like that if it's in Spanish. And so why not offer that to get a better sense of what their, uh, uh, um, what their attributes are, what their aptitude is, so that we place them in an optimum career path in the Navy that turns it into a win-win for them and for the institution. Another example might be uh, the requirements that we have for SAT scores for those candidates that want to go into an ROTC program, right? So our average ROTC scores are 1450, all right? If, if a minority candidate scores a 1450, uh, on SATs, as an example, it's a competitive environment. They're going to be recruited by some of the best colleges in the country. And so then there's the Navy or the or the Army. And so um, should we take a look at a more balanced approach with respect to how we look at those, uh, how, how we how we look at um, how we look at uh, uh, attracting those candidates to the Navy? And as as, as SATs, uh, is that is, is that uh, do we place too much weight on a standardized test as an example? And so there's a couple of examples. There's, there's more context behind that, Richard, but it gives you a sense of the things that, you know, we, we didn't set a high standard, uh, you know, to we're, we're trying to set a high standard in order to, to attract the very best. But it's not the single metric that uh, that determines who what what the best really is. Right. And so um, we didn't intentionally do that to limit minorities. But uh, over time. That's what happened. Is you, and if you take a look at the officer, if you take a look at the enlisted force versus the officer force, we have a much, uh, we have a much, we, we, the, the, our enlisted force really does uh, reflect uh, America. We need to do better in the officer side and certainly better within the flag ranks. Oh, that's helpful. Thanks. Um, just to switch gears to another uh, question from the audience here in our couple of remaining minutes is there's one on Arctic security. Uh, control of the Bering Strait. How does Arctic security relate to control of the Indo-Pacific? Um, obviously, this is an increasingly important issue every year as there's more water uh, up there. So uh, how is the Navy uh, tackling that uh, phenomenon? So we're an Arctic nation uh, and we have to compete up there. Other nations are competing. We see an increasing, at an increasing rate, China and Russia in particular, um, uh, I said this in a in a in a forum a few days ago, but a few years ago, uh, our operations uh, in and around the Arctic Circle were rare. Uh, the Harry S. Truman did a deployment up there a few years ago in 2018. We heralded that as the first flight ops above the Arctic Circle, and uh, uh, you know since since the late 1980s. Um, uh, but I would tell you that it's no longer rare. In the past year, we've had some 20 operations and exercises in the high north and above and above the arctic circle we're doing some of that by ourselves but we're doing most of it with allies and partners either bilaterally or bilaterally or multi multilaterally we're about to do an exercise up in uh, uh under northcom up here off of uh, off of alaska in the coming weeks and so we are operating uh in the high north much more frequently than we have in the past there were three different combatant commanders that border the Arctic. So you have U.S. Northern Command, Indo-Pacific Command, uh, and we also have uh, uh, U.S. European Command. And so, uh, so within the, the, the as the Joint Staff makes recommendations to the Secretary on how we ought to posture the globe, the Arctic certainly has to factor in. And I think that the global posture review that the Secretary 
uh, that the secretary has uh, instituted and is ongoing right now, I think will give us, I think we'll take the Arctic into account, uh, how we want to operate up there probably more frequently as a joint force and how we may have to change the distribution of forces in order to do that. Uh, and so I would say more to follow. Uh, I'm not trying to be evasive on that, but I think more to follow as a result of that, uh, as a result of that assessment that gives us, uh, that sharpens our view and insights into how we ought to operate globally uh, across those uh, those problem sets are identified in the defense strategy. Um, well, we're just about um, at time, and we got to let you get back to the people's work and everyone else as well. But um, maybe I can just put you on the spot as a final question. Are there any particular conundrums that knotty problems that have yet to be worked out? You've given us a lot of answers, but um, mm. uh, and and to <laughs> to this interrogation, but uh, but are there things that are that are still uh, challenges that the sort of strategic class, I guess you could say, of people thinking about national security should be particularly focused on as the Navy moves forward with this evolving set of challenges and all of the uh, issues that you raised in the NAV plan? I think um, I'm a real optimist with respect to the national defense strategy. And I really thought in 2018 how important that strategy was uh, because it really, it really, and first of all, it laid out priorities, which which should help inform not only how we employ the force, but also our investment strategy, right, in order to compete and win in, in the future. Uh, I do think that most recently, uh, we're having a lot of debate about the employment of the force and being able to get that right with respect to the strategy and balancing current readiness and future readiness. Future readiness would be the, uh, would be the, uh, 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 would be the modernization of the force, and so I think we have to we have to think think um, more carefully about uh, how we employ the force, where we employ the force, and in what numbers, right? So it gets back to Secretary Mattis's intent to be uh, operationally unpredictable. Uh, and an example of the Navy to use the Navy's mobility to our advantage across. Uh, across uh, different AORs, I get back to a global approach or a trans-regional trans approach to those problem sets. I just think that there's so much more to talk about there. I think the Global Posture Review, I'm very optimistic, is going to help us think more clearly about how we operate uh, as the strategy intended uh, against, those, uh, against those top priorities in a way that, uh, that puts in a us in a better position to compete and then uh, if we have to fight and win. Great, well, that um, is helpful on, on the end of those uh, who, you know, try to think about some of these things at CNAS, we're doing work across some of these issues. So watch this yeah. space. Uh, and we look forward to um, being in touch on those things. But um, Admiral Gilday, thank you for your time today and for sharing your thoughts with us. We really appreciate it. Um, the, the some of the supporting documents uh, we should say for folks in the audience if they're curious are out there the the NAV plan and and other things that that have been issued over the past few months and um, and thanks to everybody for joining us uh, in the audience for the questions uh, today and and Admiral once again thanks to you for for being with us Richard thanks I really appreciate it thanks for what your organization is doing it's important great thank you have a good day everybody and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.